all of the work that has been done thus far has really led to the, the establishment of new relationships. I think there's now a much better understanding among government entities, the private sector, and of course, patient groups. We've never had better collaboration among NIH, FDA, CDC, and BARDA, for example, and we, we absolutely need to maintain those going forward. Advocacy helps anchor us in the real world. I think Research America appreciates very well the need for the public, and they continually keep touch with the public and do surveys and ask, you know, what is it that makes the public support research? I also think you need to engage with your patients. People remember what they see them in and touch themselves. And even when you're doing a good job taking care of a patient, talking about, I'm hoping to make you better because of what I'm doing in the lab, resonates with those patients and they take that out and multiply your efforts. Anybody who works in the biomedicine field and life science field, first and foremost, uh, has a keen sense of the ultimate impact, which is improving the lives of patients, including those who are not even yet sick through prevention. And that is a, a major motivator to, to cause one to take the kind of pain and risk that it takes to do the, the, the research to be able to find new drugs and new vaccines. Building enthusiasm in the community, I think, is very helpful. Everybody wants to make it a better world, and certainly the research that's being accomplished throughout the nation and throughout the world is, is pretty spectacular. I think that partnerships that researchers develop can become very important. I think it's really important to have advocates for science at all levels of the career trajectory. It's absolutely necessary to have the grassroots scientists and leaders at the various organizations and institutions involved, it's not sufficient. The sufficiency brings organizations like Research America that have a platform and a bully pulpit to really convey that message at the highest levels of government leadership in the country. To be able to help spread and scale these resources so we could take away barriers to access so that young people all around this country and, and even around the world can have access to incredible health education, public health communication resources that can move the needle, you know, in a positive way on health behavior change. You cannot center social justice without centering well-being. And you cannot center well-being without understanding the social determinants of health. We really need great collaborators to join in this fight and to show a true commitment to lifting up those among us who have been left behind. Congratulations to all of you. Um, Research America uh, commissioned an actual uh, poll uh, in January, um, which revealed that more than 80% of the respondents, which were adults, expressed concern about misinformation and disinformation, um, which of course leads to uh, undermining uh, trust in, in scientists and researchers and research institutions in particular. Um, as a matter of fact, early this month, the Coalition for Trust in Health and Science was launched with 50 leading organizations who have pledged to take on this issue. And I, I think all of you have seen trust in science wax and wan um, over particularly the last couple of years, but uh, for most of us, we saw elements of it much earlier. And in fact, the historical context of this is the, um, 
is the history of this country where we've had a stream of anti-intellectualism since Jefferson. So it's not surprising that we see this uh, popping up, but of course, in COVID, we saw it at a level that most of us had never seen in our lifetime. So Larry, let's start with you. Um, let me ask you whether you've experienced in your career um, a shift in the way people view science and scientists. Well, l let me start by saying how, how grateful I am for being acknowledged here today. To be on the same sentence as Mr. Porter is amazing. And of course, it's his legacy that is my starting point to answer your question. Um, Mr. Porter was such a tremendous advocate for science, and he understood how important it was for people to explain science to the general public. So that's, that's not new. We, you know, we, we've known this for a long time. What has changed is that, and I'll call them external forces, um, have prompted people to turn fact on its head, to ignore um, things that are, are truths, um, and then when you superimpose this echo chamber, which in the previous panel talked about social media, you have this deadly combination. And, and whilst, you know, of course in the last several years that's been further amplified, you know, we, I've seen this throughout my career at NIH and, and, and before. And I think the first panel gave some very good suggestions about how this needs to be approached going forward. And I look forward to the comments of my colleagues here on this panel. Pam, um, how do we distinguish between legitimate questioning and, press and, and spreading false information? Well, I think that science is meant to be a self-correcting process. And things come out, and sometimes they turn out to be sustained, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes we're suspicious. The scientists are suspicious right out of the gate. And we're pretty sure that there's a lot of disinformation out there. And that's very challenging. I'm not sure all of this is brand new. Uh, it's usually attributed to Mark Twain that uh, a lie can go around the world while truth is still putting his boots on. <laughs> and uh, and uh, if you go back uh, centuries before then, Jonathan Swift not only affirmed that, but also said that once the lie was out there, even when the truth comes forward, the lie lingers and reverberates. And remember, he didn't have Twitter to contend with. <laughs> so I do think that these are, these are issues. I think science is meant to be something where we investigate things. Strange ideas are our grist for the scientist's mill. We need to investigate things. There may be an odd idea that turns out to be right. On the other hand, we cannot let things that are harmful to patients stay out there unchallenged. And I think that COVID has brought both of those things to light. Sometimes there are brilliant suggestions or things that are important and we've investigated them and it's been important for the patients. Sometimes we've been, been confronted with drugs that could be actively harmful or the use of which deprives other patients who get genuine benefit from the benefit of those drugs because they get bought up. I think it's a challenging process, but science is meant to be self-correcting. And the better we teach our students uh, the, uh, the uh, approach to science, the better off we're gonna be. One of the things that we didn't do during COVID is explain to the public that the science, our information about COVID was going to change over a period of time. Um, and they weren't ready for what they thought was flip-flops, but was in fact more information uh, going on. Uh, Mike, let me ask you, uh, you're a scientist that tasks uh, with building research enterprises into communities. What role does trust in science play in the partnerships that you build? Yeah, it's absolutely <clears throat> critical, and to come back to the point that was just made by Pam, um, the scientific process is one where we develop hypotheses and then attempt to falsify them. That's the process. We know that in the scientific community. Along the way, we will falsify hypotheses, and we will go on to new ones. As that process gets picked up by the various forms of media that were discussed in the previous panel, what the public sees often is the sausage being made, and it's messy. 
<clears throat> and there's processes and steps, and little things get grabbed and get amplified before there's a consensus or a self-correction. So what we found in terms of the trust in our community, and I, I should add that the community that I'm in, in in Southwest Virginia, in Roanoke, Virginia, is a relatively small community, one that didn't have an academic medical center until a decade ago, that I had the honor and pr privilege to be part of building, we partner with the community. So you have a research intensive university, Virginia Tech. You have a private not-for-profit health system called Carillion Clinic. They already have the trust of the public. Now we're doing something new. What we had to do was reach out from the beginning. And like, what I always like to say is the dollars we're spending are the taxpayers' dollars, whether it's NIH and federal money, state or local money. And I think about the hourly wage worker. It's their money that's investing in what we're doing and we're working for them and we have to earn their trust. And two ways we go about it, we bring the community in on a regular basis. The night before last we did brain school for the public and had hundreds of members of the community. And we bring in speakers to speak to the community in a way they can appreciate and understand. We have to keep doing that. We can't give up communicating with the public no matter how bad these, this misinformation seems to get sometimes. And Lori, how do you uh, factor in uh, the skepticism about science uh, into the messaging when you uh, start your creative process? Well, actually, if you don't mind, no. I'd like to tag team on this with Dr. Williams. So, Jide, would you like to start us off? Yeah, well, I think um, the first thing I want to just point out is that skepticism has been around in certain communities for a long time in this country. It's, you know, communities have been neglected, communities have been underinvested in, communities have been struggling with trust issues with healthcare systems, academic centers, and our research sense of excellence for a long, long and time. And suffered from uh, what some would call unethical behavior by science itself. So, so when COVID hit, Many of us who have been working in this space were not surprised uh, by the misinformation, the disinformation, the skepticism that was magnified because we were dealing with a global pandemic. What we need to do is we need to build or rebuild trust. And the, 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 the issue is with COVID, we didn't really have a lot of time to do it. So we had to short circuit our usual trust building approaches. Uh, to try to deal with the pandemic in an urgent manner. But building trust takes time. Building trust takes real investment in communities. And change occurs at the speed of that trust. And so I think one of the things we have to start doing is being more proactive and less reactive when it comes to engaging and building trust and investing in these communities. Citizen science is something that I think that has great opportunity for building trust in these communities. But I also think that it's important for us to invest in cultivating credible messengers. And investing in cultivating credible messages is a way to begin to bridge that trust gap uh, so that we can develop messages in a much more participatory manner that will allow us uh, to really close that gap. So, so I'll take it from there in terms of, so for us at Hip Hop Public Health, it's a mouthful, um, we are an organization that really uses the power of learning through music, the cultural connection, the science of behavior change to really deepen health literacy and spark behavior change on a path towards health equity. And when we, when we first look at creating, we know that those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. So with our interdisciplinary team of, of artists and researchers and educators and young people, um, we go through, as, as Dr. Hamburg was saying before, an iterative process, an iterative process to deepen that health literacy. The second thing that we do is that it is that community-based participatory approach. We want to speak to those that we are looking to reach the most and include them in that process. And lastly, um, the power of young people through the model that we work with, which uh, embraces a child-mediated health communication process, young people can really help nudge. They can move the needle on health decisions. We saw during the uh, pandemic, you know, teenagers were not the ones who can make the decision in their household if 
they were going to get the vaccine. And yet we you know, galvanized their energy and their support to nudge their caretakers, to nudge their family members, to have that child-mediated communication strategy as sort of was alluded to in the first panel, to really help build those bridges of trust within community and within multi-generations. Uh, uh, Newbar, uh, in a startup company, how do you explain to the public uh, what you're doing to ensure that they trust what may be the outcome? Well, um, so my experience in the last few years was with Moderna as a co-founder, and, and you know that, that has put trust in science to an extreme test uh, in the last few years because it was so urgent and so kind of uh, noisy, the whole field. And I think one of the things that we've learned is that if you're dealing with innovation, it's a different type of trust because you have to admit that there's a lot of uncertainty. And the problem is that that uncertainty, which scientists are trained to take on and experimentally try to reduce, it's hard to explain until you do the experiment. And so on the one hand, you know, scientists, particularly experts, want to simplify things, which makes them black and white, and then they kind of project a level of certainty which is inappropriate. Somebody mentioned earlier that during, during COVID, there was a lot of uncertainty and changing directions. But if you go out and say, well, we're not sure, but we're doing the best we can, and here's the data, and when we get more, then that's very confusing. So I think, I think there's a, it's, it's a tricky thing to trust in the future. It's hard enough to trust in the past and the present, but then trusting in the future when you're actually battling uncertainty and you can't be completely predictive or hardly at all, is a very different kind of trust. And what matters there is how you communicate uh, the transparency, the consistency, the track record, the number of other people who are actually collaborating in trying to bring about an outcome. Those are all things that actually enhance a level of trust. But if I may say, Donna, it's really almost about the future, you have to think about it as, a, as an act a bit of faith. And because you really don't have enough facts to support the belief the way you would with science. Sometimes you venture into faith. I don't mean just religiously. I just mean temporarily suspending this belief long enough to allow science to do something it's never done before. How you can project trust in that, in that period of time, is ex much, much harder. And it's about communicating. It's about consistency and transparency. But it's also, as someone has suggested, about trusting the messenger. Mm -hmm. And the question is, who are the messengers? Well, if, if well I was just going to say that, uh, to your point, I think credibility is the cornerstone of persuasion. And if someone credible is, is, con is uh, counseling you to trust in a future, you are more likely to listen to that credible person. So I think one of the It things, doesn't have to be a scientist. It doesn't have to be a scientist. I think one of the important things is that we need to do is to really start unpacking, uh, deconstructing who the credible messenger is. Uh, and once we understand who the credible messenger is, we need to cultivate those credible messages and bring them into the process so that they can be our extensions in the community, um, you know, proactively so that when another crisis happens, we already have an army of credible messengers ready to support the initiative. But if I could just add one thing to that, if I might, Donna. Um, I think it's really important in terms of credibility and trust. You've got to earn it. And the way you earn it is not hyping the latest result that may turn out to do X or Y. It's when you tell people the truth. And the truth may be, you know, this didn't work this time. And we're going to have to take this route. And that's part of the education process, back to the, the types of communicators, whether they're scientists or whoever they are. And, and I'm, I'm afraid sometimes uh, media uh, tends to want to project things out as if this is the final solution to some problem. And it's up to us to talk to the public and communicate about the scientific process and what's working, what's not working, and how we have to reevaluate things, I believe. You know, the one thing that I... That I uh, I haven't had this problem at 82. I don't fool with the social media very much. <laughs> and, and I don't watch the cable news. And so uh, to, it seems to me that the, the, the mistrust, uh, unfortunately, has been created by the political world. Uh, the politicians always want to find something, each side wants to find something wrong with the other side. And, and as a result, there are uh, 
misconceptions created by those who are elected leaders. And I, th I think that we have to, uh, as, as a society, let them know that we expect better of the political world. But um, I, I've learned, just listen to what Mike says, and it's, it's going to be all right. Yeah. So there are a lot of different approaches to this, and you have to understand people's lives and the, and the community that you're working in. So it's got to be more bottom up than top down, it sounds to be like what we're saying. Well, yes. What, what, I, what I did want to say, sorry, Gita. Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, going back to the messenger, and this sort of connects to the previous panel as well, it's, it's the messenger, it's the messages, and the tailored messages. It's also understanding the right moment and the right mediums, or the various mediums, because just putting the message out there in one way with one voice is not going to connect to everyone. I, th I, think it's, I think you've put your finger on a lot of that, but I think it's important to be communicating all along, not wait for the crisis, not wait for the, something to blow up. I think it's important to be communicating with the community. Many studies now are showing that community health workers, for example, are the most effective in, in affecting change in health in our, uh, among our, our patient population. More effective- You should have learned that from the developing world. <laughs> More effective than us doctors, I, you know, I have, to, I have to say that. But the other people to con continue to communicate with, and it tends to be a pain for many academics, is the media in various ways, the little bits. Can I talk to you about something here? And you, know, you, you have to answer them, and you have to answer them honestly, and you have to answer them nicely and politely and respectfully. But you need to have that whole ecosystem trained on truth. And Thank you for saying that. If you don't that. have it trained on truth, um, you're going to wind up with these ups and downs and swings that we've seen in COVID. Thank you for saying that, because what we typically see is there's a crisis. Lead, lead researchers and the academic community galvanizes, parachute into the community, and try to get them to do things that they're like, we don't know you. Who, who, where did you come from? What we need to do is have a sustained bi-directional relationship proactively so that when these crises come, we're not scrambling to find credible messengers to help us mediate the problem. And that's where investment needs to, to be put. We never invest in that, though. That's where we investment needs to go. We're, try but we're trying to do that. Um, at NIH, we learned from the pandemic that you, as you said, you proceed at the speed of trust. But one of the things that we've pledged to do is to use that same approach beyond the pandemic in, in our everyday business. And hopefully we will be successful you know, in, in doing that. Larry, one of the things that surprised me since we had the rule when I was secretary is that uh, no one got into their white coats I used to have a white coat rule that if they were going to talk about science to the public, they had to put their white coats on. So, because people did trust doctors during an earlier period and nurses. And, and I think that's the point. It was in an earlier period. Um, I think, unfortunately, as things played out during the pandemic, for, for a whole range of reasons, th there was some mistrust. Um, some of it because of legacy. Um, some of it because of, of, of you know, this, this hyper, you know, barrack chamber that we have called social media. Um, I, I think, you know, we face the challenge of dealing with confirmation bias, which is now all around us, um, which is antithetical to the scientific method. Scientists are taught to, to prove the null hypothesis, and yet the rest of society wants instant confirmation, instant gratification. And so it's that nexus that, that we have to overcome. Let me go around and, and see what your best recommendation would be to, um, uh, to counter a lot of this misinformation if you had to go through it again. What, what would you do, have done in Moderna, for example? Well, it's, 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 it's okay. yeah, yeah, it's no, not it's, clear. it's complex. It's, it's tricky because, look, I really want to make distinguish when people are using the word truth, knowledge, 
those things don't exist when you're doing something that's never been done. And I'll just take the opposite side of this and say, we have to be careful that we don't engender trust in things we don't even know to be the truth, so that we make it simple for people to digest what we pretend is the truth. That was what we were dealing with, is that there was this incessant, like people insisted that you cannot develop a vaccine in less than five years. That was the truth before. The truth we were trying to create was a vaccine that together with the NIH colleagues could be developed in months. That could never be asserted as truth. So what do you do as a scientist? Do you pretend that's the truth to, give, to get people to trust you? Or do you actually deal with it, get the data, and then try to build trust? And that is, so I, that's why I said, I think it's very different. If, if people don't want to believe in gravity, that's a different issue of scientific understanding of trust than when you're dealing with a virus that's mutating and you don't know what's going to happen. So I'll just say that it's tricky with innovation in a slightly different way, let alone then getting into the community, which I agree with. The messenger part, if you're, I, I would argue for humility. I think that as scientists, we're all encouraged to become experts. When we're experts, we lose our humility, and we want to constantly say things that are declarative and right, and we're very often wrong. That's the scientific method. And so how do we expose how wrong we might be and still inspire confidence? That's what we struggle with. And so I think you have to cultivate and continue to cultivate uh, honest and respectful uh, dealings with the community that you're, uh, that is important to you, uh, and there, be that the patients or be that the public, uh, public health who are not patients yet. And I think the respect for people who are not scientists needs to uh, infuse all of your communications with, uh, with uh, the public and your patients. Uh, the word I'm going to use is messenger, but a different kind of messenger. Messenger RNA. <laughs> and I think if we'd have been telling the story well for the last couple decades and connecting the dots about fundamental discovery, such as the important discoveries about messenger RNA, and we got to the point where we were at our backs up to a wall and a public health emergency and then had to explain all that, we'd have been better off if we'd been continuing the communication, the engagement, the building a trust process and not waiting for the next pandemic. Yeah, I, I think, I think the, that you make a lot of uh, good points there, Mike, because what happened is that the, the public wanted immediate answers, and they were not immediate answers. And so, uh, and I'm not sure that the, um, that the media wanted, the media loves controversy. And so the more controversial things became, the more people became concerned. But I think this, the, if you can figure out a way for the scientific world to provide answers, some of which might be we don't know, along the way, the public's going to have a lot, lot more confidence. I think it's incumbent upon scientists to become more knowledgeable and conversant with science policy, with communication, and with engaging engagement with communities uh, for all the reasons that everybody has, has, has alluded to. I think one of the tipping points in acceptance of the vaccine, um, or vaccines, is the engagement of communities who were disproportionately affected and people saw themselves and people who had volunteered. And I think that went a long way towards building that acceptance. Um, two things. One, I think uh, for us to be curious. So when someone doesn't have trust or doesn't have confidence, let's, let's ask why. Like, why is it that you think that way? And let's be a little bit more curious instead of a quick sort of judgment in terms of what they bring to that decision. And then the second thing is, um, if there is some misinformation out there, especially for those that have incredible platforms, those in the media, those in the entertainment world, in the artist world, let's not just call them out or shame them. Let's see what we can do to call them in. You know, as colleagues have said up here about, you know, having those coaching conversations with the media, having, you know, if someone says something outrageous, let's take them to the side. Let's have that conversation and see if we can flip that and then ultimately use their incredible platform and their incredible um, opportunity for amplification in, in a much different direction. Okay. Yeah, so I think that we need to build cultural literacy in our scientists 
so that they can better engage our communities. And I think we need to build scientific literacy in our communities so that they can better engage our scientists. Thank you very much. Uh, extraordinary. <laughs> we've got the hook. We, we've got the hook, so we do have to end this. I did once think, after uh, a year in Congress, that, that maybe no one should be allowed to run for office unless they had taken a couple of science courses. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody.